Hello everyone, my name is Pekan Gupta and I'm a Solutions Architect at Smart Modular Technologies and I'll be speaking about ADSFF form factors for storage, memory and acceleration. In today's topic, we'll be covering about ADSFF form factors, their mechanical, electrical and connector specification, how ADSFF is used in storage, memory and acceleration use cases. Let's start our journey by defining what ADSFF is. ADSFF which stands for Enterprise and Data Center SST form factor is a group of specifications which standardizes mechanical, electrical, thermal, and test aspects of storage and memory devices. These specifications are agnostic to any wired protocol and they do not define or depend on any software programming model. Therefore, the EDSF form factors can be used beyond storage, like for memory expansion use cases along with CXL, C6, and OpenCAPI kind of protocols. Or it can be also used for hardware acceleration implementations like computation storage or smart NICs. The EDSFF specification enables any type of media to be used as a backend. This allows same physical device form factor to be used as SSDs with NAND flash, memory modules when using a DDR4 or DDR5 DRAMs, or as a persistent memory device with storage class memories built into it. The EDSFF specification is independent of any controller implementation. The end user can choose an ASIC, FPGA, or any application specific IC as a brain of these devices. Now let's look at the mechanical aspects of the EDSFF form factor. The EDSFF spec categorizes all devices into two categories based on the height of the module. The E1 or 1U devices, which fits 1U rack servers, have height less than 44.45 millimeters. This is the height of 1U rack server. The E3 or the 2U devices can are designed to fit 2U rack servers. When vertically mounted, users can connect 16 such devices in a single server. This increases the server density or the device density in a given server and lowers the total cost of ownership as you can get maximum value out of a given hardware. The standardization of these physical interfaces and mechanical dimensions improves the interoperability across OEM devices and the rack servers. It also helps to maintain backward compatibility between different generations of servers and also interoperably use and exchange devices and modules across various servers. In later slides, we'll also see how the height of the devices determine the density and the performance of these form factors. Now let's look at the, another dimension, the length of these form, form factors. Both E1 and E3 form factors are further categorized into short and long in the, uh, length of these form factors. The E1 or the 1U form factor is available in two different lengths, as you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. The E1.S or the 1U short is aimed for performance. The mechanical specification of this form factor is defined in SFFTA1006 document. The E1.L, which is the lengthier version of the 1U form factor, is defined in SFFTA1007 specification. E1.L is also known as ruler form factor in the industry because of its appearance. This is, this is mostly used in high capacity or high density SSDs. Similar to E1, the E3 also defines two different lengths. The E3S, which stands for E3 or 2U short, and the E3L, which stands for 2U long. However, the mechanical specification of all the E3 form factors is defined in a single specification document by name SFFTA1008. Now let's look at the thermal profile or the, which determines the thickness of these devices. The EDSFS specification goes a, a step ahead in defining the thickness and the thermal profile of each of these devices. This thickness determines the height of the heatsink, which allows the mechanical and the thermal engineer to determine the airflow conditions while designing the chassis. The E1.S specification 
which you see on the left left hand side as one u short defines five different device thicknesses with each supporting different power and thermal requirements starting from 5.9 mm which supports 12 watt going up to 25 mm which supports 25 watt of total power however e1.l the one u long form factor has only two profiles 9.5 mm with 25 watt power and 18 mm with which can sustain up to 40 watts of power on the contrary the e3 form factor defines two different thicknesses for each 2u short and 2u long the thin e3.s which is the 7.5 mm or 25 watt profile is known as e3 1t form factor the e3 2t form factor which is shown second from the right is can go up till 40 watts of power similarly e3.l has two thicknesses and can sustain power up to 75 watts which just stands short of the pci added card powered by an edge connector now let's look at the adapt the connector or the adapter specification which is defined in sffta 1002 document the e1 or the 1u form factors can support two types of connectors 1c which has 56 pin contact and can support four differential high speed data lanes and 2c which can go up to eight differential high speed data lanes on the other hand e3 or the 2u form factor can support up to by 16 high speed differential data lanes this enables similar throughput as pci add in card the connectors are designed to support backward and forward compatibility which means a 1c device can be plugged into a 2c connector and vice versa similarly an e1 device with 1c or 2c interface can be plugged into a 4c adapter this provides interoperability across various use cases where devices can be interchangeably plugged into a common server now let's look at how edsff form factors are used in storage applications um, one of the very common form factors used in storage or ssds is 2.5 inch ssds which is defined in sff 8639 specification the connector as what you can see from the first row in the second column def defines multiple protocols on a sim single interface the u.2 interface can support sata sas and pci signals on a single connector this is an inefficient utilization of the pins because at a given time a device can support only one type of high speed protocol this also lim limits the performance of pci interface because even though the, there are sufficient pins to use available for its use uh, e3.s protocol on the other hand is protocol agnostic it can support by 16 high speed differential data pins which can be used for any protocol it also adds additional sideband signals for low power and led control and clock and wake up for enabling low power modes u.2 specification is also limited by the operating temperature uh, the specification specifies the maximum threshold of the temperature to be 55 degrees c which is very restrictive for memory expansion and acceleration use cases on the other hand the sffta 10023 which is the power and the thermal specification for e3.s defines does not define any temperature threshold rather it defines airflow impedances which gives freedom to oems to design their devices with industrial grade components and maintain airflow by throttling their fans to bring the temperature within the uh, bounds of operational uh, temperature for a given use uh, module lastly e3.s can sustain up to 40 watts of power which expands its use case for high density memory expansion and acceleration use cases as compared to u.2 which can only sustain 25 watts of power now let's look at another form factor which is very commonly used in storage applications which is m.2 and compare it against e1.s if you look at the connector 
of an M.2 uh, interface, it supports multiple protocols. This is also an inefficient use of pins as some of these protocols are not available on all the servers and therefore this does not provide the best use of number of pins available on a given PCB real estate. E1.S on the other hand can support by eight differential data lanes which can run up to 32 giga transfers. This allows E1.S to achieve 2x the performance for similar size as what an M.2 can support. The biggest advantage of M.2 is it cannot support, it does not support hot plugging. And therefore, in order to service this device or to add or remove an M.2 in a given system, you have to completely shut down a server. An E1.S, on the other hand, can be hot plugged and be uh, added or removed from a server through the rear end of the chassis. The M.2 is also power constrained because it can only support 3.3 volts power supply. And E1.S on the other hand uh, has 12 volt and a 3.3 volt input, which enables its use in high current drawing applications where the acceleration or high density memory expansion uh, components are used. On the mechanical side, the E1.S is slightly bigger than M.2, allowing more space on the PCB to fit more components and also better airflow conditions for high temperature use cases. Now let's look at the memory side of interface. The biggest challenge the hardware engineers are facing in today's world is designing PCBs for modern day servers. The PCB real estate is really saturated and there is no room to add more DDR DIMM slots next to CPU sockets. It is increasingly difficult to add more pins for CPUs, CPUs and also to route these parallel interfaces on a, within a given board space. Increasing the speed of these parallel interfaces brings another challenge because now you have to use more layers for the routing and also use exotic materials and special PCB manufacturing techniques, which increases the cost of PCB manufacturing. So adding more DIMM slots is not a scalable option. And therefore there's an industry trend to move to serial attached interfaces by using cache current interconnects like CXL, CSX, OpenCAPI to expand the memory beyond the DDR DIMM. Now let's look how EDSFF solves that problem and simplifies the board design. One of the biggest advantages of EDSF form factor is reduced pin count. This slide compares a 288-pin DDR4 connector with an equivalent E1.S or an E3.S form factor. The first row in the table compares the number of pins in both these connectors. The E1.S 1C connector has only one-fifth the number of pins as compared to a DDR4 DIMM. If we compare only the data pins, the E1.S has 75% fewer data pins as compared to a DDR4 DIMM. Even the E3.S, which supports by 16 interface, has half the number of pins as compared to a DDR4 DIMM. This proves that E1.S and E3.S have far more lesser pins than an equivalent DDR4 DIMM form factor. The second row compares the size and the area occupied by the connectors on the PCB. The E1.S connector takes about 20% of the board space compared to a DDR4 DIMM. This indicates that board designers can accommodate up to four E1.S connectors for every one, every DDR4 DIMM socket. The last row compares the voltage rail required by these form factors, which remains fairly constant across different families. But whether EDSFF form factors can achieve the same performance as the parallel interfaces or not is answered in this slide. Let's take a closer look at the performance. This slide compares the DDR4 running at 3200 with a PCI Gen 4 and Gen 5. As shown in the first row, the DDR4 running at 3200 data transfers can achieve peak throughput of 25 Gbps per second. Whereas an E3.S running a PCI Gen 4 by 16 can theoretically exceed the performance of a DDR4 DIMM. For future generations where PCI Gen 5 is used, which runs at 32 giga transfers per second, it can exceed the performance of DDR4 even when running 
on an event.s with a 2c or a by8 interface and a PCI Gen 5 by 16 which is available in e3.s form factor can actually go beyond DDR5 throughput. So this proves that device connected through a serial interface can match performance of a direct attached parallel interfaces. This also solves the problem of memory bottleneck which comes with increased number of CPU cores per socket. Now let's look how the EDSFF form factors are used in acceleration world. The EDSFF form factor enables a unique combination of bringing compute where the memory or storage is. Having an FPGA built on the module allows the user to offer specific fixed functions from the host to the EDSFF form factor based accelerators. This picture shows an example of a computational memory or a computational storage device available in the EDSFF form factor connected to a 1U server. Each 1U server can have 16 or at max 32 such devices based on the thickness or the thermal profile. User can add inline encryption or inline compression on the FPGA and do offload, offload the computational part on these modules while doing a basic load and store semantic to the media stored on these devices. This also enables CPU agnostic architecture because it decouples your memory from the CPU architecture and allows you to independently upgrade your memory technology to whether DDR4, DDR5 or any persistent or storage class memory independent of CPU architecture. Let's look at another example of using smart NICs. The OCP NIC is a very good example of using EDSFF form factor in an acceleration world. In this example, few extra, adding few extra sideband signals on an existing 4C connector, the, the E3 form factor was converted into a smart NIC kind of an application. Now, this since E3.L can support up to 70 watts of power, these NIC cards can actually run a similar application or workload as compared to a PCI add-in card powered by an edge connector. So in summary, an EDSFF form factor, which is which was defined as enterprise and data center SST form factor, is actually an enterprise and data center scalable form factor because it can be used in storage, memory, and acceleration use cases. Again, it's not one specific. This specification is distributed across various documents, some of which are mechanical or some of which are electrically oriented and others define the connector uh, interface. The biggest advantage of EDSF form factor is a composable architecture. It helps you to save money because you do not have to over provision your uh, server. You can add devices as it is needed. It also helps the serviceability and the maintenance of the devices towards the end of life because you can add or remove the devices without shutting down the server. And the best of all, the EDSFF form factor improves the scalability. This was the end of my presentation. Hope you liked it. Please let me know and take a moment to rate this session. Thank you.